please welcome Brad Pitt. Wir machen weiter mit einem weiteren Superstar. Please welcome Leonardo DiCaprio. The one and only Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> the wonderful Margot Robbie. And last but not least, producer David Heyman. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen to uh, Berlin. Thank you very much for bringing this wonderful piece of art movie to the premiere, to the German premiere. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Quentin. Let's get started with you. I mean, this movie, your ninth movie is awesome. It's really mind-blowing. It's great. It's fantastic. I would like to know, Quentin, uh, why, because it, it took you five years to basically write the story. Did you ever get to a point, because it's based on a very gruesome tale, on gruesome murderers, um, did you ever get to a point while writing the story that you actually said to yourself, I don't want the Manson family to get more into my head. I, I'm going to quit. I'm going to stop writing the story. Uh, well, <laughs> just gave my answer, all right? Yeah, yes, I, that absolutely happened. At some point, um, quite a few years ago, um, I was kind of working out the idea of the story. I think I, I'd, I'd written a few different scenes. But um, just before, I'd done a little bit of research on the Manson family, but just before I was getting ready to do a, a deep dive and really, really start doing the, the research and really learning the whys and wherefores and learning more about them than I, I knew a lot, but I was going to now learn a whole lot more. But even the idea, I mean, the movie, you don't hear Charlie talk, but I wrote some scenes where you actually see Charlie. We shot him. We just didn't make the movie. But even to try to get to know Charles Manson enough that I could write his vocal rhythms so I could write his speech patterns and write the way he talks, I was like, do I want to do that? <laughs> Do I want to let these guys into my head like that? Do I want to know Charles Manson so well that I can write his speech patterns? And I, uh, you know, four or five years ago, I was like, eh, I don't think so. <laughs> and so I, I, I put it away and, and, and did something else. But then the material that I wrote, I liked so much that it just kind of, after that project was, was over, it gravitated me back to it. And then in between projects, I just kind of pushed the rock up the hill a little bit further. Glad that you finished it, though. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Um, Shannon and David. Um, Shannon, you've been working with Quentin for quite some time, so you know his body of work. And David, you basically joined as a newbie, being <laughs> the producer of this movie, <laughs> not as a newbie, producer. Um, people call this uh, Quentin's most personal movie. Would you agree, and why would you say so? Well, it's a lot about his growing up and uh, his memories of being a child in Hollywood and driving around. Uh, Los Angeles, and you, when you see the marquees and the theaters, I mean, those are things that were actually there. And as a kid, those were there. And we, the radio, which is a backdrop, KHJ, are also part of his memories of driving around Hollywood and listening to the sounds of KHJ. So, David? Well, that's pretty much answered it. <laughs> <laughs> What makes it a typical Quentin Tarantino movie, would you say, David? Well, I think nobody else could make this film but Quentin. You know, it's got his singular voice. Um, it is, as Shannon said, and as you indicated, an incredibly personal film. It has, it's just so full of life and originality and, f and, and uh, freshness. And really, it is a film that could be made by no other. Uh, you feel that in every frame. You know, Quentin brings such enthusiasm to making films. And uh, one of the pleasure, it's a great pleasure to work on his films because of that. And you can see that enthusiasm in every frame of this film. Margo. My face is crimson. <laughs> <laughs> Margot, you, you have an incredi incredible body of work that you've done so far. Uvita is amazing with the stuff that you've done. But this was perfect timing 
in getting the role of Sharon Tate. Could you tell us the story that how how you, the two of you basically got together? Yeah, I um <clears throat> I, I I knew I always wanted to reach out to my idols, Quentin being at the top of the list um, at one point in my life and let them know how much their movies meant to me and affected well, my career choice and my taste in movies. And I uh, wrote Quentin a letter, but I held off for a couple of years. I didn't feel like I was really at the stage of my career where I felt like I um, was ready to reach out. I didn't think I was a good enough actor yet. Um, and then I watched the first cut of I, Tonya, and I thought, okay, I feel like I've Uh, hit the point where I'm happy with my acting now. Now I'm going to reach out to my idol. So I wrote him a letter and fortuitously it was great timing. It timed out nicely and um, we met up, we spoke about Sharon, we spoke about the film. I got to read the script when it was done and um, here we are. Fantastic. And uh, next to you, Margot, it's great to see Brad and Leonardo together on the big screen for the first time, even though you had uh, Uh, basically matchups in, in TV series a long time ago. Uh, Leo, what I would like to know is um, you play Rick Dalton, an actor acting in a couple of movies and TV series. How difficult was it for you to be acting as an actor? Uh, it was interesting to say the least. Uh, it was a little bit existential at times because through the journey of finding out who this character was and the creation of him with Quentin, I I had to realize that so much of who the character was was in a day in the life of a guy acting on a semi-bad TV show. And that was the catalyst for our journey in, in, in creating Rick, is me getting that footing. And I just love the way he constructed the story of two sort of voyeurs, two guys that are on the outskirts of Hollywood and giving us this incredible backstory of who these men were beforehand. We all, the second Brad and I stepped on set, we had this incredible history together that we implicitly and I think instinctually knew. So we we're able to infuse all that in sort of two or three days of their life where you don't tell a full story, but we, we had this sort of, sort of silent understanding of our past. And that was, that's what's so amazing about a journey like this is trying to tell a story and a condensed time period like that, but all of us having that understanding of, of our own history. Brett, do you agree that basically what you've endured throughout your career, the profession of friendships that came about on set next to being away from family and friends made it easier for the two of you to connect and to feel what Rick and Cliff basically went through? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, Quentin chose to tell the story of, of I guess, um, Filmmaking process, television process through a, a, a stuntman, an actor at that time, which was much closer. But we all here sitting here rely on our, our friends uh, specifically for, to, to survive this thing, to enjoy this thing, to, to negotiate our way through it. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of downtime, more downtime than, actually, than actual action time. And so it was, a, I mean, we had, it was pretty automatic for Leo and I because we, um, we could just step right into that. And, and like Leo says, the backstory, I mean, there, there's a whole, there's probably two movies of prequels and backstory <laughs> yeah. that, that Quentin laid out for us. So it was, um, it was good fun. Thank you so much. Vielen Dank, dass Sie sich alle schon gemeldet haben. Wir fangen direkt an, in, in der Ecke, erste Reihe. Questions from the floor. Thank you very much. Does it work? Yep. Yeah? Okay. Am besten this vielleicht einmal aufstehen, dann kann man das besser sehen. Yeah. Uh, I'm Marcus Wimmer hey, several times. Um, when you have been here last time, Berlin, you already mentioned that you only want to shoot 10 movies. Is that true? Is it still true? And um, I also heard that you would like to do a Star Trek movie and maybe a Kill Bill 3, mm -hmm. which wouldn't count then. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, can I slide that one in there? Uh, yeah, 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 right, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, uh, that's the plan, is to do 10 movies. I'm not really sure what the 10th one is gonna be now. It could be Star Trek, it's a pretty good script. I, I, I'm holding off to deal with them until after all this is said and done. Um, but me and Umu have talked about uh, what could be the, uh, uh, I'd always had an idea for Kill Bill 3, but then I just started thinking about it a little bit more in the last six months, and I came up with an, an interesting idea. So I, I called her up and just told her about it and see what she thought, and she, and, uh, she liked the idea. So 
I don't know if I'm going to do it, but I wanted to just, you know, find out, gauge her interest in it. And she was very interested in it. So it was like, um, I'll see. Or it might be neither one of those two. It might be uh, just something that's in here right now that I don't know and it pops up and uh, reveals itself. Um, if I wanted to have a loophole, I guess I could treat Star Trek as like, well, and naturally when I said I was only going to do 10 films, there were obviously going to be 10 originals, so obviously Star Trek doesn't <laughs> count, you know. Um, but if you're going to say you're only going to do 10 films, looking for a loophole, all right, is not necessarily the way to go, I, you know, I think, uh, uh, but I, you know, okay, so part of me actually thinks that, okay, well, no, if I'm going to do Star Trek, that should be the last movie, because that means I mean it, and that means I, I, I give a damn. But then I heard a guy on a podcast say something like, I want to see Star Trek. I want to see Star Trek. I don't want it to be the 10th film, but I want to see Star Trek. All right. And well, I understood that too. So I don't know. <laughs> that is the greatest. Well, I get a question from the lady right here, and then we move to the back. Fourth row on here in the ecke. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, this is actually a question for Brad, Leo, Quentin, and Margot. Um, I've just seen the movie, and there were cigarettes everywhere, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this was basically the bad habit of everyone, or the neutral habit, depending on the time. I wanted to know what is your bad habit, your personal. Mm. Twisting my hair. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. It's fine. It's late. <laughs> okay. What's your bad habit? Cigarettes. Really? <laughs> Uh, picking my nose. <laughs> <laughs> Which will be a lot of people here, but you're not going to have the balls to say it the way I do. <laughs> and you, I, I just procrastinate a lot before going to bed. <laughs> That's not even a bad habit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next question from the gentleman right there. Yeah. Fiederei, genau da. Yeah. Hello, Philip Teubner. It's a wonderful movie. Hey, I like your uh, tailor, Philip. Uh, thank you very much. I like this movie also. <laughs> a question to Mr. Pitt and Mr. DiCaprio. Short question. This is a wonderful homage to Hollywood and to filmmaking. What does film and filmmaking mean to you right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well so, no, I mean, it's... A, it's, it's <laughs> You know, it's an, it's an, I love storytelling, and it's an industry that we all appear to love, we wrestle with at times, um, but ultimately it's about storytelling, and, and we, I would say we all feel very fortunate to be able to do that. Right now it's a really interesting time, because you see the cinema experience shrinking, you see streaming exploding, the positive of that is we see this wealth of talent that's been on the sidelines all this time, this wealth of talented directors and writers and actors, and, it's, and really gutsy storytelling is being, um, is being embraced. So that is really, really fun to watch. Um, what happens to the communal experience? Uh, we'll see, I don't think it'll go away, but um, it's certainly, certainly in a shift right now. But I, we go with the times, we go with the changes, and, and, and it's, all, it's all right with me. I don't think it can ever go away. Um, people will always, I believe, want to go out to movie theaters and have that experience. It is the greatest art form in the world. I'm honored to be a part of it. And as Brad mentioned, you know, we're entering an era where we're inundated with not only content and information, but new, amazing you know, stories are being told, the, the format of which remains to be seen, whether the two-hour, three-hour format will stay intact or whether things are going to be seven-part series because, you know, there's so much content. But I don't think we're ever going to lose that communal experience of being able to go out to a theater together and feel the energy of a movie we're excited about. And that's why this movie was so incredible and awesome and I'm honored to be a part of it because it's a... It's a, a big-budget, fantastic art film, and that we may see a lot less of. But that's why you guys got to keep going to the theaters and supporting films like this. Margot, I, I have a question um, about the jewelry, because I heard that Deborah Tate, actually, the sister of <coughs> Sharon, gave you some of the original jewelry that Sharon actually ha had worn. Um, did that help you? 
uh, sort of embrace the character more? What was the feeling that you had when you were wearing it? Yeah, no, that's true. And um, I wore it every day that I was in character as Sharon. And yeah, it was like a little talisman. It just helped me feel, feel a little more connected to her. Yeah, I did find it helpful. Thank you. Frage da hinten, und dann machen wir hier vorne weiter. Hey, uh, Tom Westerholt, German Public Radio. Good to have you guys. Thanks for coming today. Thanks. Uh, we know that you all have uh, stunt doubles or doubles. How do you say, by the way? Stunt doubles or doubles? Doubles. <laughs> That's it. So we know that you guys have stunt doubles on set <laughs> while you shoot movies. But I'd like to know, question to Margo, to Leo and to Brad. Uh, I'd like to know in what everyday situation would you guys really love to have a stunt doable to, to jump in for you and do the stuff you have to do? Oh, man. Any opportunity I can, to be honest. <laughs> Going through airports. If someone else could do that for me, that'd be great. <laughs> oh, you mean in real life? Is that Yeah, yeah, like yeah. an everyday situation oh, where you That's love to have a, a stunt doable. I've, I've heard many people suggest to me when there's lots of paparazzi outside that I should have some sort of double, but that kind, kind of thing never works out. As little Kim said, the paparazzi is going to get you one, day, one way or another. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so that would be a great opportunity, but it never works out. I'm going with that as well. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a fine choice. Frage hier vorne von... Yeah, genau, da, und dann machen wir direkt weiter. Hi, I'm uh, Dennis from Kino.de, and this one goes to Quentin. Um, you have changed history already with the power of cinema and in Glorious Bastards, and without spoiling the film, you did it again with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, how do you come up with these ideas, and what, what are your intentions? Well, I can't really go too deep into that, because I'd be giving away the ending of my movie, and I don't want to do that. Uh, um, but... Um, In the case of okay, uh, in the case of uh, Inglorious Bastards, I mean, basically, I just wrote myself into a corner, and then I had to figure out how to get out. And uh, uh, yeah, they're supposed to kill Hitler, and then they're, I'm, I'm writing it, and actually, everything's going pretty good. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, th this could actually work. All right, uh, I thought they'd get caught before now, and uh, and so I didn't know what to do, and it was like four o'clock in the morning or something like that, and then I just thought. What if I just fucking kill him? <laughs> you know, I, I I didn't want it to be like you know, oh, it's a they killed him, but it's a double because I've seen that before, and the eagle has landed, or they didn't want to have to slip him out the back door. I, so I just said, no, I'll just fucking kill him. And then uh, I took a piece of paper. It was like four in the morning. I took a piece of paper and I just wrote on the piece of paper, just fucking kill him. And I laid it on the bedside table and I went to bed. And I thought when I get up the next day, I'd see that piece of paper and either think it was an idiotic idea or it was a good idea. And uh, after a night's sleep, and I looked at it and I go, no, that's a great idea. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and Brad wasn't down with it at first, all right? Uh, we, we, I go to talk to him about it. And uh, uh, we're having a nice conversation. And he goes, okay, I'm not so sure about this killing Hitler thing. I'm going to do it. Okay, that's not the question. I'm going to do it. I'm just not so sure about it, all right? But then at some point, I think about like three weeks into the movie or something, he showed up on set and he goes, I've got religion. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember reading the script and going, can you do that? <laughs> can, you, can you kill Hitler? <laughs> I, actually heard, I actually heard a cool thing. Somebody was saying that... Um, They were 12 years old and they were seeing Pulp Fiction with their dad and like the, the credits are playing and then like you hear a, a Miserloo and then all of a sudden the radio changes and it goes to Jungle Boogie. So like we change the opening credit song in the middle of it. And then the 12 year old kid turns to his father and goes, can they do that? And the father goes, now they can. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha from Radio NRW. Um, a question to all the four of you. Um, we got a lot of car driving here in the movie with some uh, great music. Mm. Um, so I was wondering, what are your favorite songs in the car or maybe a favorite genre of music um, while driving? Heavy metal, classical music, what do you prefer? I'll start that off. I, I mean, one of the things I like about <laughs> driving with music uh, is I'm 
sure everybody in the room has this feeling of like, you kind of feel like you're in the opening credit sequence of your own movie. <laughs> you know, when you get the, like the, when you can actually go kind of fast and like not stop and start and you pick like the right song, you just, yeah, it feels like, like it's the Quentin movie and this is the opening mm. credits and the, the, uh, what's going to happen next is going to be a big adventure. <laughs> and so I wouldn't say that this is like my favorite song for that, but a, a song that works really well because they use it that way in, in the movie was Blondie's Call Me. The way they use it, uh, Richard Gere, you know, driving through mm. Beverly Hills to Colby. He was like, that was a great opening credit sequence. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a playlist that's moved, like songs that have been in Tarantino films. I listen to that a lot. <laughs> you pick a good song. You pick a great song. I'm tuned to one channel, and that's 40s Junction, 40s music. <laughs> Really boring. Really? Yeah. Well, I got a fr oh, friend who. You can try to swing, swing, swing. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know of someone who listens only to classical and then watches everyone on the street and it's like comedy for him. When, <laughs> so that was just like, when I'm in traffic, I listen to classical. Yeah. You're like, calm for the down. calm, for the yeah. LA traffic. Yeah. I, li I listen to stand up comedy. Hmm. That's my gig. <laughs> That's his thing. Shannon, David, um, you know, as, as the producer, you have to watch the whole project. And once you read the script and basically saw and read that uh, Quentin wanted to jump back into the late 60s to basically capture that time and the change in Hollywood, were you thankful that the whole thing was based in L.A.? Is that probably the most thankful city to be jumping back in time <coughs> because it's so easy to set everything up? It's not easy to set up. Yeah. <laughs> no, nope. wasn't not that easy. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it, it was a lot to do that. I mean, we were blessed that we were able to shoot it in Hollywood and all around Los Angeles area, and that we got the incentive and that people were really on board. It's a very location-based movie, so we moved around a lot. Very rarely were we in any place. So for, we started off for two weeks in one place, and then we were on the move the whole time. But we had a wonderful team who got it set up. Our location production designer and everyone was really very fluid about getting it done and worked their butts off. They've yeah, so Quint, no, no. Oh, no, I was just, oh, no, just going no, to say about the <laughs> fact that, uh, uh, I'm trying to cut David off, but I was just going to say the fact that it's like, a, um, we wouldn't be able to do what we did like next year. It's going it, to, it'll be a little too much changed. We wouldn't be able to do it exactly as we did like even next year. Even as it was, things were changing during the shoot. So it was like we were on a bridge that was on fire, burning behind us. And we were just trying to get our stuff, and then, and then, then the bridge would go away. And like, it was kind of that way through the whole 100 days of shooting. Mm -hmm. You got to understand, Quentin is a purist. So that means no CG. Everything, we're going to get everything in camera. So to see Hollywood Boulevard, even the stretch we did, what did we shoot? Four blocks? Four they blocks. dressed... And then we came back a month or so later to do a few more blocks to piece that whole thing together so we could get the street. But what, what was stunning to see was the depth of detail <laughs> that only comes from Tarantino. And that is like, not just the bus stop benches where ads from that time, but then even in the store windows, things that you'll never see, the pamphlets of, of some radio show of that time or books of that time, it, it was that deep in detail and we just, go whizzing by, but it was, it was really pretty special to uh, see Hollywood Boulevard transform that way. Wir haben noch Zeit für drei Fragen. Einmal hier vorne die Dame, dann der Herr mit dem Jeanshemd. Erste Reihe, zweite Reihe. Genau, hier vorne direkt. Ja, da. Thank you. Um, Johanna Stein from Spätvorstellung das Kinomagazin. Mr. Tarantino, I've got a question for you. First of all, thank you for another great movie. Oh. And um, your recent movies like The Hateful Eight and uh, Django Unchained and even Inglourious Bastards, they were set way in the past. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is set in 1969. So um, is it different and maybe uh, more difficult to create a story that shows a time that a lot of people still can remember? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, it's funny because uh, you do a Western, you're, you're, you're making a period film, but for some reason, I mean, I know it's a period film compared to if I was making a movie that takes place today, but you know, you go to a Western town, and I just, it just doesn't seem, it, it didn't seem as much of a, I, it just seems controlled in a strange way, where um, this is close enough to our time, but it's also incredibly different, and so it creates a different kind of... Uh, um, Uh, detail. Um, I got to say, one of the things after doing uh, a 40s World War II movie and two Westerns back to back, 
the fact that I could just have a character turn on the radio and just enjoy a song for 10 minutes was just, it was almost orgasmic for me. I couldn't, it was just so much fun. Oh my God, I can turn the radio on again. They can listen to records again. I can have rock and roll in my movies again. It's been a decade since I've had rock and roll in my movies. Oh, unless I did it anachronistically, which I did. All right, you know, so uh, the fact that characters could just like Godardian groove to records was uh, fantastic. <laughs> Question from the gentleman right there. Hi, uh, Levin Trio from Belgium. Question for Quentin. Um, so it's been mentioned that it's your most personal movie in a sense because it goes back to what you you know, uh, knew as a child. Uh, so in a sense, it's been inside you, this movie, forever. Uh, so why did you decide to make it right now and not, not before, not after, but right now? Does it have to do with the fact that you are only going to make 10 films so you kind of want to get this out before you quit as a director? Um. Well, yeah, I wanted to do it before I quit. All right. Uh, uh. <laughs> um, you know, it was just its time. It was its time. And, um, you know, I'm pretty organic. I mean, uh, um, I'm going to maybe say something pretentious. Uh, um, so, warning. Uh, um, uh, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm pretty connected to my instrument, and so I don't try to push anything. Um, it, I, I just trust it. I, I, I trust it. So I, when it's the right time, it'll, it'll it'll be there. All right. I don't. Need, I'm not even a guy who, when I come up with a cool line or a cool thing, oh, I got to write it down. Hey, if I don't remember, it wasn't that fucking good to begin with, you know. Uh, uh, um, so I just kind of. Uh, uh, so in between, so I kind of worked on the film in between projects, and just I just kind of thought that was just kind of the way it was going to be, and then uh, in, after, and I thought maybe this might be my last movie, but then I started writing it this time, and then like oh hey, the the horses just ran away, all right, so I was uh, oh I guess I'm going to finish it, so uh, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Letzte Frage von der Katharina Dame. Dokon. Uh, it's a question to Quentin Tarantino. Uh, your film is for me a kind of homage to uh, Sergio Leone. And my question is, in which way did he influence your style as a filmmaker? Well, um, I personally think that um, Sergio Leone is kind of the, what I would call the, the father of, of what, I guess what I would call modern movies. Um, both his use of uh, the way he used music, but even more importantly, um, the way he put it together and then cut to music. That was not really done before. Uh, people would do uh, soundtracks, and even when they put like, you know, uh, Rock Around the Clock or something uh, in a movie, they wouldn't cut it to the movies. I mean, every once in a while it would sync up in a neat way, but it's not cut to it in this way, uh, partly because uh, they didn't know what the music was going to be until after the film was over. Well, Leone had Morricone write the music before the movie, and mm -hmm. they would even play it on the set. And I just think that final, uh, uh, the final shootout in uh, Good and the Bad and the Egg, I, I, that's my favorite moment of cinema of all time. And the idea that like it's one of the greatest comedy violent stories, and you go through this entire three hour journey to get to that bull ring. And you've kind of grown to love these guys, but they don't love each other, which is very frustrating. Mm. And um, and then, I mean, that's just, I, to me, it's just the greatest moment of cinema, the way that's all built up and that gigantic suite of music and then just cut to a fairly well. I mean, I, it's just, I, it's un... Uh, it's the it's the Sistine Chapel as far as as far as I'm concerned. But also the other thing about Leone is I like the idea that uh, you know him and a lot of the spaghetti western guys they started out as film critics, very similar to the way that uh, the French New Wave did. And no one really loved movies more than those guys, and they loved westerns. And I love the idea that. Uh, they loved Westerns, but they knew they were making Western movies, so they wanted to do it their way, and I love that. And I also love the idea of thinking in, uh, cinematically, thinking in terms of set pieces, the way Leone did, where it's like a, an eight-minute cinematic set piece that's just completely on to its own, or a 15-minute, or a 12-minute. I mean, if you look at Once Upon a Time in the West, I mean, that is just a collection of set pieces, just connected to each other. Well, I love that. I love set pieces. I love, to me, that's like... You know, that's when you know that you're sitting in a movie theater, you know, and then the film is just taking you over. And then you're like the, uh, 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 you're thinking uh, Wolf of Wall Street, the, uh, uh, the Quaalude right. sequence is fucking amazing, all right? And it's like 15 minutes right at the end of a, 30, a three hour movie. And it's, I never want it to end. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you so much. We love your movies and we love you guys being here in Berlin. Thank you so much, David, Margot, Quentin, thank Leonardo, you. Thank you, Brad, for feel so and Shannon. Thank Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 Thank